I typically use Google Street View to e-walk on Tokyo and Paris and stuff, so I'm glad someone is using it for more socially useful uh, purposes. Um, our next speaker's parents were born in Belgium, but he tells me his name is pronounced Olivier Humblet, so that's just fine. Uh, and he is <laughs> Vice President of Data and Analytics at Propeller Health. Uh, this is a new firm we're going to hear about in just a second. Um, broadly, Olivier comes to Propeller or came to Propeller as a scholar of toxins and pollutions and their threats to health, in particular asthma and chemical exposures and the link between the two and respiratory disease. I saw a presentation that he uh, gave a couple years ago where he just showed he was able to use a small device to measure a degree and severity of asthma and asthma stimuli, I guess, uh, around different parts of the city. And it was one of these presentations that make you just go, wow, at the very end. So I remember it very fondly, and I'm looking forward to uh, seeing how this work uh, plays into what the firm does. So, uh, Olivier. Great. Thanks a lot, Merlin, for that really warm introduction. And uh, thank you all for coming to the talk. Yeah, I'm, I'm really pleased that you remember that talk, and that's, that's the kind of data I'm going to talk more about today. So let's get into it. So I'm also going to be talking about how to use new digital health assessment tools to enhance population health research, with a particular focus on asthma and chronic obstructive um, pulmonary disease, COPD. And the example <laughs> I'm going to be talking about a fair bit is a study that we have going on currently in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm going to start by talking about the need for these kinds of tools, what they bring to the table, how they can enhance population health research. Um, then, as I mentioned, I'll talk about the AIR Louisville study, which is a community-based health intervention and research study. And then um, I'm going to close by switching gears a little bit and talking about how healthcare reform incentivizes links between the private sector and population health research in a way that can make use of these new technologies. The, the overarching question here is, why do we need new assessment tools when we can already bring a patient into the clinic and ask them lots of questions and do assessments of pulmonary health, such as spirometry, um, or take biological samples, do omics? We can already do all those things. Why do we need new technologies? And the reason we think is because, oh, sure. Sorry, should I start from the beginning? Um, um, the reason we think is because it's, it's quite hard to know how the patient is doing outside of the clinic. And that's really where we'd like to go, is to be able to monitor people in real time and know how they're progressing in between clinical study visits in which we might do in-depth assessments. And the current tools for doing that really aren't that great. One still commonly used tool is the asthma diary, which is where you give a patient a piece of paper <coughs> and expect them to go away and every single day fill out what symptoms they're having, um, what their medication use is, and do that for some sustained period of time. And this is really burdensome for patients. They don't like to do it, and they won't do it for any, really for more than a couple weeks. And even then, the, the data that comes out of there is, is suspect. And it's really not enough. You know, some people try and take these and just put them on a smartphone, or have you receive them in an, in an email in your inbox every morning. It's not enough. It's just things need to get more uh, more passive for the patient, less burdensome. And this is where Propeller comes in. This is a company founded by David Van Sickle, a cohort four scholar in the Health and Society Scholars Program. And his idea, and this is what we've been doing since then, has been to make these, this family of medication sensors that snap onto inhaled medications for asthma and COPD. And so the idea is that the patient uses their medications as they normally would. For example, when they're having an exacerbation of their respiratory disease, they just take their medication, but the sensor records that the medication use is taking place and uploads it to our servers automatically. And then that's data, the data gets pushed back down to the patient through mobile applications that they can then see and understand their trends and triggers. And then also, um, separately, the data goes to research and care team online dashboards so there can be continuous real-time monitoring of the patients. And so I think that the point to stress here is that there's, 
um, ideally no <coughs> burden on the patient. The sensors have batteries, they last for a year, and so the patient doesn't change anything about how they manage their disease, but this information stream is coming in and can be very useful. So how can you use it? Well, it's important to note that when these sensors are used and paired with a smartphone, then each medication use will be linked with GPS coordinates. And so all of a sudden you can pull in all kinds of very interesting data layers. You can um, pull in meteorology, <coughs> um, pollen counts, air pollution data, and again, through the latitude and longitude, link to the multitude of spatial information layers that you can pull in. So what you get out of all this is a much more detailed and refined digital phenotype where you have information on medication use, symptom patterns, environmental con context and exposures, surveys, and then ideally also physiologic data. And suddenly you can answer questions that you really can't answer otherwise. To pick a few examples, you can do some very, very detailed work on what are the very specific triggers of, in this case, an asthma attack at a certain point in time because you have this rich data stream to work from. You can also ask questions about what drives progression of disease severity over time. Or how do people respond to an intervention? Again, you have a very detailed data stream to monitor their patterns of symptoms before your intervention and afterwards. So it enables some new research questions to be asked and answered. And it also enables us to look simultaneously at the individual level as well as at the population level. And I think the individual level is very exciting because you can imagine if we have somebody's data for an entire year, that is a, a rich enough data set that we can use each person as their own individual trial, use them as their own control, and give them feedback that is very, very specific to them. What are their triggers as opposed to, well, in this population, on average, this thing is a trigger for most people. So that's a new direction and a very exciting one, I think. So we've been deploying this in various research study with studies with outside researchers. And one that I'm going to focus on in particular is what we have going on in Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville is a city that has been named one of the top 20 most challenging places to live with asthma in the US due to a combination of air pollution and climate. And this is what led the city of Louisville to spearhead an effort to really to put together a coalition of groups, the specific ones I'll talk about more in a moment, um, to implement a combination health intervention and also research study. And this has been funded by the, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to enroll 2,000 asthmatic patients. And the, the actors in this intervention are, are an interesting cross-section of, of who's who in Louisville. So as I said, the um, coordinator is the city working along with, uh, with Propeller Health. And the University of Louisville is also involved, but there's also a number of private sector players, including um, a large health insurance company, Humana, Walgreens, Norton, and people that have not necessarily been involved in community health interventions in the past. And so this, this Air Louisville project kicked off a few months ago. Uh, enrollment is ongoing and it's going quite, quite rapidly. But so we're still waiting on the results from the full study and that's going to be very exciting. But some results that we do have already, which I can share, are from a pilot study that was begun a few years ago and was somewhat smaller, it enrolled 300 people. And the goal was really as a, a proof of concept for the larger study, to show that we can collect this data from a, uh, a free living population of people uh, without a ton of clinical support, that we can collect data from them, that we can see clinical improvements in this population, which is really important. <coughs> and furthermore, that the data that we can get from these people can be used for assessment of the temporal and spatial patterns of rescue inhaler use in the city. The goal being to identify contextual factors that cause asthma exacerbations. So some of the early results of this, and I should stress that this is um, 
work that's being conducted in collaboration with uh, Jason Sue from the UC Berkeley School of Public Health. So what you get from this data when you have the spatial coding of rescue inhaler use is, is data such as this, which is a, a map of the hotspots of rescue inhaler use in Louisville. And th this is nice. It's, it's nice to look at. But what's more interesting is when you can start pulling in contextual layers, um, as I mentioned, the many, many publicly available uh, data sets that are spatially linked. And this includes a number of things. I won't go through the whole list, but we have air pollution, pollen, weather conditions, proximity to various potentially hazardous things, land use of many, many different types, and then also socioeconomic factors that we know are also very important, household income, educational attainment. <coughs> and all these things can be put into spatial and temporal models to figure out what is driving rescue inhaler use in the community. And then the specific statistical um, methods that we used are negative binomial regression. And so this is a method where we aggregate the data by day, count the number of rescue inhaler uses that are going on, and then correlate that with all these different data layers that I mentioned. So some of the key results, and this is um, a work that's currently being reviewed, is that we see a lot of the associations that we expected to see, which is actually a good thing for a new technology. We want to see that things more or less are the way we would expect. So we see a lot of associations that have been seen before with air pollution, mold, weed pollen, socioeconomic status, and also um, being in near public gathering places. But what's more novel and interesting is that we find some things that we hadn't really expected and that are suggestive of further research and interventions. One of the main ones was we found some inverse associations, so protective associations with green space of vegetation, including forests. And this is interesting. There's, there's a lot going on there. It's hard to know exactly what's going on. Um, it's plausible because of many different mechanisms. Trees are associated with temperature regulation, reducing air pollution levels, and mitigating stress. Um, there's also the fact that where there are trees and green space, there is an absence of other hazards. So it's possible that that's some of what we're picking up. Um, it's hard to know, but it's an interesting direction and something that we hadn't seen before and that hasn't really been explored before because there hasn't been this kind of data to look at in the past. So it's not perfect. Um, the air pollution data especially is reconstructed from a network of EPA monitors um, around the city. And that means we have to do some interpolation. It ends up be being a somewhat crude metric of regional air pollution on a given day. But it's the best we have right now. Um, similarly, some things like traffic counts are cruder than we would like them to be. For example, um, right, so traffic counts is an annual average count, which loses a lot of the temporal specificity that we would like to have. Another limitation is that we only have people's geographic coordinates when they use their inhaler. And if you think about it, we would really like to know where they are when they're not using their inhaler to have a better reference there. And so that's something that we will have in the Air Louisville study, but did not have for the pilot study. So that'll be an improvement there compared to the data that we already have. And so what does it mean? Well, so far we had these results and it indicates that we can, you know, the goal is to inform policy. And so we have Louisville specific results that we can take back to the policy decision makers in Louisville and try and motivate policy change. These results also helped uh, spur the larger study that, as I mentioned, is going to have some more detailed results. And so that will be interesting as well. So, but yes, these early results are kind of a, a, a sampler before the main course of the air Louisville results that are coming down the pike. So with that, I also want to, to switch gears now. And you, know, you could summarize what I've talked about so far as saying, if you take research and add technology, then you get something that's pretty exciting. And uh, another synergy that I also see coming is really between the private sector and public health researchers. And I was really gratified to see this be discussed um, so eloquently this morning. Um, by Laura Gottlieb and, and Jeff Levy. I thought that was a really exciting discussion. Uh, they brought a lot of, uh, of insight and expertise to this question, and I, I hope you're not expecting um, either of those things from me today. 
but, uh, but I still think it's, it's really exciting. And so the backdrop here is that we are switching from a system of fee-for-service healthcare to value-based healthcare, where in essence what this means is that people can make more profits if the patient does not get sick in the first place. So it's incentivizing prevention in a way that I think is really novel and exciting. And um, what this means is that there's a need for people to understand how to prevent disease when, for example, you're a large healthcare provider and you've never asked yourself in the past, how do I prevent disease? It hasn't been, uh, it hasn't been in your wheelhouse. And so now all of a sudden you have to ask yourself the question, how do I do that? And I think that leads you in the direction of social determinants in a way that's going to be really, really interesting. So, for example, the way it's happening right now, when healthcare systems do what they call population health, this tends to mean a, a nurse care manager <coughs> that's managing a panel of several hundred sick patients. And their goal is to help people not get sick in whatever way that they can. But having talked to these people, you know, it's a very difficult job. They don't have very good tools. And quickly they're running into um, socioeconomic barriers of the types that the people in this room would probably not be at all surprised by. You, know, you have problems of, of food insecurity, of lack of housing, um, of cost issues. And so what, what I think is interesting is that these care managers are kind of morphing into social workers in a way or at least that's the direction they're being pushed in, pushed in. And I think it'll be really neat to see where this moves. And there's, there's a real lack of knowledge and I think a, a hunger in the healthcare providers that we talk to. They don't exactly know what to do. They don't know how to move the needle towards prevention. And so I think that's where there's a lot of space for researchers like the people in this room, uh, groups like the round table on population health improvement to step in with a lot of expertise there. And it's, it's not a panacea by any means. Just because there's interest in doing this doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of obstacles. Uh, most notably, you, know, you have to prove that the return on investment is going to be there for the healthcare system. Um, they don't really have the expertise to do this. And as uh, Anna diaz Rue pointed out so eloquently this morning, it's not clear that the types of interventions that can be implemented by a healthcare system are really going to move the needle that much against a backdrop of, of social disadvantage that is driving a lot of these problems. But all the same, you know, I thought Laura said this really well this morning, um, healthcare systems are moving in this direction and we really need to try and support them with more evaluation, more knowledge to help them make sure that this is a productive effort and I think this is going to be a, a trend to really watch in the future. So I'm hoping we're going to have much more much closer partnerships in the future between researchers and provider networks that are trying to move upstream towards the social determinants. So with that, I will stop and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>